afternoon. Nice to see all of you. It's been a few weeks. We've been traveling. Some of you have been with us. Did everyone have a nice fourth? Yeah. yeah. Good. Jennifer has seen enough of me over the past few weeks with oh, all no. of our trips. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I've got a few things to start off today, and then we'll jump right in. Good to see you again. Okay. Uh, today, the United States designated three senior Hezbollah political and security officials, Amin Sheri, Mohammed Rout, and Wafiq Safa. They have assisted the Iranian regime in its efforts to undermine Lebanese sovereignty. These officials have exploited their positions to smuggle illicit goods into Lebanon, undermining Lebanese financial institutions to assist Hezbollah, and to evade U.S. sanctions against Hezbollah facilitators and financiers. Today's designations are a part of the United States effort to counter Hezbollah's corrupting influence in Lebanon and to support Lebanon's stability, prosperity, and sovereignty. The United States' maximum pressure campaign against Iran and its proxies, Hezbollah chief among them, already, has already succeeded in limiting the financial support Hezbollah receives from the Iranian regime, the world's leading state sponsor of terrorism. As a result, this designated terrorist organization has been forced to take unprecedented austerity measures. In March 2019, for the first time ever, Hezbollah's leader Hazran, Hassan Nasrallah made a public appeal for financial support. As these designations demonstrate, any distinction between Hezbollah's political and military wings is artificial, a fact that Hezbollah itself acknowledges. Accordingly, we continue to call on our allies and partners to designate Hezbollah in its entirety as a terrorist organization. It's my turn. Okay. The United States congratulates Ambassador Rima Bint Bandar on being the first woman appointed to serve as an ambassador of Saudi Arabia. She presented her credentials to the State Department on July 3rd and participated in a credentialing ceremony yesterday at the White House, beginning her new role as Saudi Ambassador to the United States. We look forward to building upon the strong U.S.-Saudi partnership and working with the Ambassador on many important bilateral and regional issues, including countering the Iranian regime's destabilizing activity, ending the conflict in Yemen, and advancing human rights. We also warmly welcome His Highness Qatari Emir Sheikh Tamim bin Hamad Al Thani to the United States. The President met with the Emir a short while ago, and the Secretary will meet with him tomorrow. Qatar is a highly valued strategic partner and friend of the United States. The Secretary visited Doha in January to lead the U.S. delegation at the second U.S. Qatar Strategic Dialogue, during which we collaborated on regional security and defense cooperation, education and culture, law enforcement and counterterrorism partnerships, commercial and energy cooperation, and labor issues. We are building upon that dialogue and look forward to discussing these and other important areas of bilateral cooperation during the Emir's visit. We will also discuss critical regional priorities, including Libya, Sudan, Afghanistan, countering the Iranian regime's destabilizing activities, and the need for a united GCC on these and many other regional issues. We look forward to further deepening the U.S.-Qatar strategic relationship and advancing our cooperation. And one more. David R. Stilwell will visit Japan, the Philippines, and the Republic of Korea and Thailand July 10th through the 21st in his first trip as Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs. He will visit Tokyo July uh, 11th through the 14th to meet senior officials from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Ministry of Defense, and the National Security Council to coordinate efforts on regional and global issues and to deepen the U.S.-Japan alliance in pursuit of our shared vision for the Indo-Pacific region. In Manila, on July 15-16, Assistant Secretary Stilwell, along with Assistant Secretary of Defense Randall Schreiber, will lead the U.S. delegation to the 8th U.S.-Philippines Bilateral Strategic Dialogue, or BSD. The BSD is the principal forum for discussing the broad spectrum of U.S.-Philippines cooperation, including defense, economics, rule of law, and regional diplomacy. On July 17th, Assistant Secretary Stilwell will continue his consultations in Seoul, meeting with top Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Blue House officials to discuss further strengthening the alliance and enhancing U.S. ROK cooperation in the Indo-Pacific region. Assistant Secretary Stilwell will conclude his trip in Bangkok July 18-19, where he will engage with officials from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Office of the Prime Minister on bilateral priorities and Thailand's year as Chair of ASEAN. He will also meet business leaders in the U.S. ASEAN Business Council. 
Are you Matt Lee today? Uh. <laughs> Do we have the AP here? No. No. Well, Rich, since you're in the seat. I'm Matt Lee's seat filler. Um, <laughs> you look a little bit younger. I don't know if I could even pretend to <laughs> oh, duplicate okay. that Hit performance, so I'm just going to pretend that I'm, I'm me today. <laughs> okay, um, good. <laughs> uh, thanks, Morgan. Sure. Uh, has the Secretary spoken with either uh, Foreign Secretary Hunt or uh, the Ambassador here uh, about his comments, and uh, is the United States or State Department planning a diplomatic response to the U.K. beyond the President saying that the U.S. will no longer deal with Ambassador Dower? Uh, I don't believe that the Secretary has spoken with the Ambassador today. I would need to double check his, his schedule, but I'm pretty uh, confident of that. Um, you know, we were in London uh, very recently and, of course, met with the Foreign Minister. Um, and as it relates to this issue in its entirety, um, there's clearly an election going on in the United Kingdom. We're going to stay out of that. We will, of course, let the White House speak uh, for the President's tweets. And I don't think the State Department has anything further to say about that. Um, just generally speaking about the relationship between the United States and the United Kingdom and as business business as usual in this building? Yeah, I mean, listen, we have an incredibly um, special and strategic relationship with the United Kingdom. Uh, that has gone on for quite a long time, and it's bigger than any individual. It's bigger than, than any government. It's something that has uh, stood the test of time and will continue to do so. Can you just hold on, Rick, you know? uh, No. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. I mean, you're not going to get anything new, but well, you can just, keep asking. Sure. Well, I think it's a sure. good question. But uh, just the President was saying that he won't deal with the Ambassador. Is the State Department still dealing, dealing with the Ambassador and the Embassy? Yeah. I mean, as I just said, uh, I don't speak for the President here, so I would refer you to the White House for anything related to his comments. Um, we don't have any, anything, any new direction to give on that. Will the State Department okay. deal with the Ambassador? We will continue to deal with all accredited individuals um, until we get any further guidance from the White House or the President, which we will, of course, uh, abide by the President's direction. Hey. Um, okay. Or afternoon. Uh, good afternoon. Mm -hmm. Do you have um, any comments, or can you confirm reports that U.S. government officials and Iranian officials um, met in Erbil last week? Yeah, uh, I think Carol just shot that over to me. I, I haven't. I, I saw that right as I was walking out here. Um, I, I've just seen your email on it. I don't have anything new, but we can certainly make that a, a takeaway, and we'll look in, into that. Um, I don't have any. Anything can you say if there have been any meetings between U.S. and Iranian officials? I highly doubt it. I think that's something that I would know, but we'll be certainly happy to, to check into that report for you. Hi. Hi, Margaret. Sure. Nice to meet you. Um, since after uh, last week, uh, President Trump meeting uh, Kim Jong-un and North Korean leader at That was Pan an Munjo. interesting trip to be on. Yes, I was there, too. Um, oh, were you? With the White House. Were you at the DMZ? The White House teams. Oh, not, good for you. Uh, not DMZ, but uh, I was there that trip. Yeah. And uh, many uh, South Korea or other uh, media is uh, so confused about this event. Mm -hmm. So uh, what is the uh, United States' final destinations of uh, the nuclearization of North Korea? So, uh, Which event is confusing? Because uh, they sort of meeting with the uh, 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 league, um, you know, he just mentioned about the uh, nuclear freeze. Mm -hmm. And is this for your U.S. goal, or you have any element, you know, any detail about uh, how are you going to do uh, mm -hmm. with the uh, denuclearization? Of sure. North Korea? So I spoke um, with Steve Began today, actually. I, I speak with him on a regular basis. I have a lot of wonderful colleagues here at the State Department, Steve, Steve being chief among them. Um, and one of the things that both he and the Secretary reiterated uh, to me and I, and I think to some of you um, is that, of course, this is a good meeting between the President um, and Kim Jong-un. I think it lasted approximately an hour. A number of issues were discussed between uh, the two leaders, including, of course, from our perspective here at the State Department, what was really important is that the President and Kim Jong-un uh, agreed to appointing uh, people for working level negotiations. Uh, the President, as you were there that day, so you saw the President clearly um, has handed uh, the baton over to the Secretary and uh, Steve Began, and they will be moving forward um, with these negotiations. And we know that the President uh, remains committed um, to resolving issues on the North Korean, uh, excuse me, on the Korean Peninsula peacefully. Um, and through diplomacy. That's our goal, and I don't think anything has changed. We obviously clearly want to see uh, the complete elimination of WMDs in North Korea. As the President has said many times, he hopes Kim Jong-un and the North Korean people see the brighter future and the brighter vision that he has 
uh, for those people. Um, but as it relates to your, your comments about the freeze, uh, you know, that would never be the resolution of a process. That would never be the end of a process. That would something that we would certainly hope to see at the beginning. But I don't think that an administration has ever characterized a freeze as being the end goal. That's would be at the beginning of the process. Yes, yeah, so still want to be a FFVD or a CVID for your colleagues. You can use whatever acronym you would like. Um, I get tongue twisted when I try to use them, so I'm just going to say complete elimination of WNDs, um, so that way I don't mess up the acronyms. Uh, hey, yeah. What the Secretary said before he left mm -hmm. um, Korea was that working level discussions would begin by the middle of this month. Mm -hmm. It puts it about next week. Do you have any uh, announcements on whether or not Steve Began will meet with his North Korean counterparts next week? Uh, no, I don't have any announcements on that. And I think, you know, all of you have been covering um, Steve Began in this process longer than I've been at the State Department. So I know that you know it incredibly well. And I think you all also know that one of the things that we'll never be able to do is sort of hash out, hash out the day in and the day out here from the podium. I don't think that's constructive um, for Steve and his team. I don't think it's constructive for his North Korean uh, counterparts. Um, and so, you know, listen, as soon as we have uh, any sort of update, uh, we'll be happy to, to bring Steve to all of you, to talk to you about it, to let you know as things progress. But I think that, you know, the, the work um, now continues, and that's what Steve and his team are working on. And we just want to give them that space uh, to do that. And I don't think that speculating or getting into the day-to-day -day from the podium is going to help Steve do that. So I just want to give him the space have for that. contacts, at least? Can you say? Yeah. Obviously, as we said every time we talk about North Korea, that the, that the contacts and the discussions are ongoing. As you saw just a couple weeks ago, it was very public. They're not normally that public. Um, but I know that the team uh, remains uh, very en encouraged um, by the uh, historic uh, visit of President Trump. You know, it wasn't a summit. It wasn't a negotiation. Um, it was a meeting of, of two leaders. Um, but, of course, that was a very, I think, special and historic a uh, day for, 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 for many people around the world, especially I think those of us who were, who were in Korea um, and were a part of that moment. It's certainly something that I think I'll take with me for the rest of my life as I work in foreign policy. Yeah. I'm sorry, can I just turn back to the UK for just one brief moment and get an explicit answer? So you have not received any instruction from the White House to cut contacts with the embassy or with the ambassador? No. Okay. On, on Yemen? Okay, not, are we gonna, so we're gonna go, to, does anybody else have a question on Asia? Yes. Yes. Okay. A lot of people? Oh, goodness. Do you mind if I come back to you no and finish problem. just everything on, on Asia? No okay, go ahead. Hong Kong. Yeah, thank you very much. Do you have anything in Hong Kong where its leadership have declared the controversial extradition bill has, is dead? Oh, yeah. What is the U.S. assessment? And separately, uh, was the uh, outgoing U.S. Council General in Hong Kong mm -hmm. barred from uh, making a tough speech uh, after the leaders of the U.S. and China reach mm -hmm. a trade truce during the G20 summit? So uh, for your second question, I believe that that was based off of anonymous reports, and that's not something that we ever validate here at the State Department. I don't see much truth to that. And then on Hong Kong, uh, I saw also the report uh, that you read. I think we have been very vocal here at the State Department. The Secretary has talked about, a lot the, about this a lot. Our position uh, has remained unchanged. Um, and, of course, we were happy to see how the events progressed. Um, and um, I don't think we have anything new. I think we've been on record pretty pretty clearly on Hong Kong on this issue. Can I follow up on Hong Kong? Okay. Um, the Secretary said before the G20 that mm -hmm. uh, Hong Kong would likely be brought up between the President and President Xi mm -hmm. at the summit. Um, do you know if they did discuss the Hong Kong issue? And c could you elaborate on they said. I don't know. See, we're not responsible for the uh, readouts for the president's meeting. That would be from the White House. Uh, I was certainly happy to check with their press team to see if they released uh, a readout from that meeting. Um, I don't know if they did, but we'll we'll take that as a follow up. Yeah. Um, no, no, we're on Asia. Sorry. Oh, okay. We're at, we have nothing new in the UK. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, uh, my name is Takemoto with Kyoto News. Uh, Hi. Hi. Which news? Uh, Kyoto News, Japan. Oh, great. Fabulous. Um, Going back to North Korea, if I may. Um, okay. Special Representative Vegan is moving, uh, traveling to Europe. He is. He I is. think he's there right now, actually. Yeah. Um, I, I wonder if you can talk about the uh, when and where he is meeting with his uh, South Korean counterpart, and also what will be the ag ag agenda of. Uh, let this me round. see if I have details on that. I do know because I talked to Steve about this on the plane that his meetings to Europe um, have been scheduled. 
uh, before we all met um, in in, uh, in Seoul. So I, I do know this has been planned for quite some time. It looks like he's in Brussels, July 8th and 9th, and uh, Berlin, July 10th and 11th. He'll be meeting with European officials, um, with the Republic of Korea Special Representative for Korean Peninsula Peace and Security Affairs. Um, and of course, we'll be working on um, follow-ups from many of our uh, conversations over the past few weeks. Um, there is no plan to meet with North Korean officials on this trip. So uh, he's meeting with uh, Lee Do-fun from South Korea, who will mm -hmm. be in Berlin. If, uh, uh, it looks like it's going to be in Berlin. Yeah, Brussels. So Brussels, July 8, 9, Berlin, July 10, 11. That's always subject to change, but that's the agenda for now. Okay, thank you. Okay, nice. Hi. Hi. Mm -hmm. um, so U.S. the State Department just approved the new arms sales to Taiwan, and now yes. Chinese government urged the U.S. government to cancel this arms sales. Mm -hmm. how, how would you um, respond to the Chinese government? Well, I, I think everybody here in this room, especially all of you um, from our uh, from the Asian bureaus, are aware of the uh, Taiwan Relations Act. Um, the State Department uh, did uh, notify uh, on the arms sale today, as, as you talked about. Um, it, well, listen, our interest in Taiwan, uh, Taiwan, especially as it relates to these military cells, is to promote peace and stability across the straits, uh, across the region. Um, and so our, uh, there's no change, of course, in our longstanding One China policy. Um, that's based on the three joint communiques, the Taiwan Relations Act. So. I don't see our notification here as anything other than complying with the Ta uh, Taiwan Relations Act. Um, the law specifically, of course, uh, you know, requires these sorts of uh, requires us to help Taiwan maintain their defense, uh, self-sufficient defense capabilities. Um, but our One China policy remains the same, and so there's there's no no new policy announcements uh, for today. Thank you. Why not? Mm -hmm. Oh, and just to be clear, by the way, it's called the Commission on Unalienable Rights. Okay, thank you. Um, he talked about um, how the commission was created in part to examine uh, new categories of rights, and he said that interest groups are creating new rights. There's loose talk of new rights. Could, mm -hmm. could you give us some sense of what loose, rights yeah, he was referring to, the sort of the, the new categories of rights that – Sure. Listen, I think when you start to look around the world and you look at how authoritarian regimes have subverted uh, human rights, um, when you look at the uh, the UN, the Human Rights Commission, um, and, and sort of how in many ways it's become a laughing stock, um, one of the reasons that, that we withdrew. Look at what China produced on December 12th. The, Chi the Chinese produced a white paper on human rights and talked about 40 years of reform. Uh, as it relates to human rights. That's obviously something that we would take issue with. Mohammed Zarif, I don't remember the exact date, but sometime within the past year has called himself a human rights professor. Uh, he may think he is, but I think there's a lot of people in the human rights community that would, would have a problem with uh, him using that label. Um, we certainly remember, I mean, not – not necessarily, maybe within the beginning of my lifetime, but we remember that Soviet Union used to talk about human rights, and you and you see, you know, we talk about this actually quite extensively um, in the human rights reports. Uh, Ambassador Brownback, who we just had up here a few weeks ago, was talking to all of you about his international religious freedom um, report. So, you know, we have seen troubling examples around the world. Uh, again, of these authoritarian regimes subverting um, subverting this human rights uh, uh, context. And so I think it's important to note here, and, and I don't want to really go too far beyond what the Secretary said and what he wrote, because I think that those pieces um, certainly speak to himself. But, you know, we think inalienable rights are the ultimate individual right. They are something that every community enjoys, and we really want to – part of this commission, uh, which is going to be very public, by the way, nothing's going to be hidden. All of you can feel free to attend and can have the readouts. This is something that all of Washington and all of the world can, can enjoy. But we are going to use this to really ground our understanding of human rights. And this philosophical debate um, is incredibly important. Uh, because of, of how we see these uh, these authoritarian regimes subverting human rights around the world. So is this – it's directed then more at authoritarian regimes and, and concepts of human rights outside the United States? I mean, as I know you're obviously aware, mm -hmm. when, when this commission was um, set up earlier, there was a lot of concern about the use of, of 
quote unquote natural law and there was some criticism that this would be aimed at curtailing rights in the U.S. like marriage equality, right to an abortion. I think if you, again, if you go back and reread what the Secretary said in his op-ed in the Wall Street Journal and also what he said here at the podium, what you're referring to are political rights granted by governments. That's not what this commission is about. The Secretary actually had talked about how he has studied human rights. It's something very personal to him. And again, we think that human rights are a bipartisan issue. This is not a commission that is set out to create new policy on human rights. That's not the point of this. Nor if you look at the people who we mentioned, who we announced yesterday that will be a part of the commission, you could see that this is not a partisan political exercise about rights granted by government. So we'll all have to take a breather and get outside of the day-to-day politics in Washington because that's not what this is about. So we won't discuss those issues? Uh-huh. Yeah, you know what? I committed. I'm sorry. I didn't go back to you yet. Yeah, sorry. Martin Griffith was in the building today. Did he meet with the secretary? You know, I apologize. I don't have any information on that. I will we'll get back to you right away on, on that. Another thing on Yemen. Uh, any comment on the UAE withdrawal from uh, from Yemen? No. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have yeah, much news. Uh, yeah. troops from, from Yemen. Do you have any comment? I don't. I'll get something for you as soon as we're, we're uh, out of this briefing. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, hi. hi. On Turkey, you've said that Turkey will face real and negative consequences if it takes delivery of the S-400. Yes. And according to Turkish press reports that were repeated in the Russian press, that is happening today. So what, how will those consequences be implemented? What steps, concrete mm -hmm. steps, do you expect to take? Well, uh, I think, to be fair, we have a report almost every other day in some newspaper around the world that Turkey is taking control of the S-400 today. So that's not sort of, that's not very new. I think we, we all read that quite a bit in publications around the world. Our position uh, here at the State Department as it relates to Turkey and the S-400 um, has not changed. Um, we, uh, you know, again, uh, everybody knows, the Turkish authorities know uh, the legislation um, that has been passed in Congress as it relates to CATSA. Um, and and all, of that, all of that remains the same. We have said that Turkey, is, as you pointed out, will face real and negative consequences if they accept the S-400. Uh, those consequences in, include participation in the F-35 program. I think that the Secretary and this Department um, have been incredibly consistent about, uh, about that uh, over, at least since I've been here and over the past year since the Secretary uh, has been here. So there is nothing that I've said um, or that the Secretary has said that uh, has changed as it relates to that. Hi, Saeed. Yeah, hi. Thank you. I want to ask about the Palestinian issue. Okay. Very quickly, are you aware of any uh, plan uh, to resume operations by USAID in the West Bank and Gaza this summer that you can share with us? Is there such a thing? Um, <laughs> what, give me a little bit seized, more color on what you're talking about. Okay. Sorry. Well, uh, USAID seized this operation some months back in the West Bank and Gaza. Let's get this killer back, you know, dramatically. And you know, somebody asked me whether oh, right, they're right. going to be resuming operations soon. There is talk of that. Are you aware of any? I have, that a, very, you can share I have with a very us? big book to get here through, Saeed. You'll have to forgive me. We're going to go digital at some point, so I'm not going to be thumbing through all of this. Um, yeah. I'm going to double check on this to you. I was talking to the team right before we come out. Uh, we don't have anything new uh, to announce on this. Um, and, and my latest information from our team is that we're not taking any steps um, to close uh, the USAID, USAID West Bank and Gaza mission. And, and so if there's anything new on that, I promise to get it back to you right away. And a quick follow-up on, you know, I know I asked you about Ambassador Friedman before, mm -hmm. uh, but he seems to always take some measures that could be construed as controversial, like, you know, doing the tunnel thing and so on. Is he charting his own policy, or does he clear that with the Secretary of State every time he does something like this? Because I, I read yeah. an article today uh, <laughs> that described Ambassador Friedman as being woke, quote-unquote. Um, I didn't read that. And I would say that we have a comprehensive whole of government approach uh, as it relates to uh, the secretary, the ambassador, advisor to the president, Jerry Kushner, Jason Greenblatt. Um, these are teams that work incredibly closely together on uh, on all of these issues. And, and, and again, we we look at this issue as something that obviously is incredibly uh, challenging, um, but that we see, we, we look at this as a whole of government approach, not something where people are operating in silos. I understand, but you know, being the ambassador and his boss directly is Secretary Pompeo, does he clear these things with the Secretary of State? 
as other ambassadors would do. Which things are you talking about? Such as, you know, participating in this tunnel opening, things, the statement that he's making about, you know, uh, annexing parts of the West Bank, other statements that he made that are really not, mm -hmm. you know, they are not in tandem uh, mm -hmm. with or not parallel to U.S. state policy. Listen, we all work at the pleasure of Secretary Mike Pompeo and ultimately uh, the President of the United States. It's a tremendous honor to work for both of them. And I know that I, I share that as well as I think Ambassador Greenblatt does as well. Um, I'm, I have uh, one more. I didn't call on anyone in the back, so. Yeah. Sure, go ahead. Just uh, two quick scheduling uh, updates from you. Pakistani uh, leader Imran Khan is coming to the U.S. later this month. Uh, what are the meetings scheduled here? Anything that you can give us on that? You know, to my knowledge, that has actually not been confirmed by the White House. I know that I have read um, the same uh, reports that you have, but I would reach out to the White House to um, confirm uh, or, or not confirm that visit. But that's uh, – we don't have anything to announce here from the uh, State Department. The second one is on the State Department. The Secretary is uh, hosting the religious conference later this month. Yes. Uh, how many – It's next week, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we hope you and any uh, – can you g give us uh, uh, any prominent nations that are not coming? Uh, India did not come last month uh, – last mm -hmm. year. So have they confirmed they are coming or not coming? So so, um, so two things. One, we did have Ambassador Brown back at the podium uh, a couple weeks ago right before uh, we left for the Middle East and Asia. Uh, I believe that I'm going to be bringing him back. Um, so he will be best to answer the details of those questions. Uh, I know that I will be attending it. Uh, the secretary and, of course, m you know, many, obviously, people from the department who remain very committed to this. I've gotten a little bit of, uh, of feedback from him yesterday. I spent some time with the ambassador yesterday talking about uh, this ministerial, and it sounds like it's going to be an incredibly exciting event. It's not something that I participated in last year, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to it this year. Um, and so any details that you need, the ambassador will be best to answer those on, in, in terms of which countries will come. I just don't have the list in front of me, but we're happy to follow up and get that for you. Um, again, sorry, guys, that it had been a few weeks since I briefed because of all the travel, but we're here um, until, I think, the end of next week. So we'll see all of you very, very soon. Thank you so much for having me.